Briefly, we again notice the three pieces of furniture in the holy place. The table to the right, with the bread of the presence, reminds us of God's desire for our fellowship. The lampstand to our left speaks of testimony as we walk in the light of his life. But straight ahead, up near the veil, we see a small altar. Quote, you shall make an altar to burn incense on of acacia wood. A cubit shall be the length and a cubit its width. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it and you shall overlay its top, its sides all around and its horns with pure gold. Exodus 30, one to three. So we have an altar much smaller than the great bronze altar in the court, not for animal sacrifice, but quote, an altar to burn incense on. David explains what is pictured in the incense altar, quote, let my prayer be set before you as incense. Psalm 141 verse two. Again, the acacia wood covered in gold takes our minds to the Lord Jesus with his perfect humanity linked with deity. You see why both the humanity and deity of Christ are essential for his role in the prayer life of the believer? Quote, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. To intercede between God and us, he must be both merciful and faithful, satisfying the perfect requirements of a holy God, and at the same time, understanding the challenges faced by humanity in a fallen world. So, along with fellowship and testimony, we add the idea of prayer and worship. Most things in our world tend to go down as a result of gravity, but prayer, thanks, and worship should arise from our hearts to God the way incense naturally does. That it was the smallest of all the furniture may suggest it isn't the size of our prayers, but their sincerity that matters. One great thing about studying these passages is that we have divinely inspired commentators in the other Bible authors. In Luke's Gospel, we're introduced to a priest named Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, and we're told they were both, quote, righteous and blameless, a high commendation, Luke 1, 6. They had a problem, however, Elizabeth was barren, and they were advanced in years. But here's the irony. The day Zacharias fulfilled his priestly duties by offering incense at the gold altar, and quote, the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, verse 10, Gabriel arrived and told him their prayers had been answered a baby was on the way. But Zacharias didn't believe him. This shouldn't be lost on any of us. God wants us to pray, but he wants believing prayer. There's a close association between the gold altar and the ark with its mercy seat. Quote, you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with you. Exodus chapter 30 and verse six. The writer to the Hebrews also writes, quote, the holiest of all had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, chapter nine, verses three and four. It had to be tended morning and evening. So for practicality, it was in the holy place, but in God's mind, it belonged inside the veil. When we visit the true tabernacle in heaven, the censer and altar are linked, 
with a long silence in heaven. Does God seem to be silent sometimes when we pray? But look, the saints' prayers are visible there. Quote, the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God. Revelation 8, 4. Yes, God hears and answers prayer. <laughs> 